Hello, my name is Amos Tarfa and I'm a medical physicist by training, but I also run a school called Life STEM Academy, which focuses on equipping students to use the gifts that God has blessed them with uh, to be a blessing to others. We teach math and science, history and uh, English. We provide them with career preparation. Um, we have the five C's, we call it. In this series, my students have asked me to talk about logic. We want to do more logic at the school. So in this series, I will be going over uh, lessons from a book called The Return of the God Hypothesis. This is going to be our focus in this video uh, reading series. And my hope is that these videos can be a blessing to people in Nigeria where I grew up because they don't have access. Some of them don't have access to some of the books that I will be reading through this series. And as I read through the books, it's also a way for me to actually go over them for the first time sometimes. So basically I sit here, I read, it helps me uh, because I'm reading through, but then also I can share some of my thoughts as a physicist. Uh, before we dive in, I want to read from Romans chapter 1. I am a Christian and I believe that the Bible is God's word. It's God's instruction. It's, the, it's what we need to live, but it also has the message of salvation, which can be found in Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will join me in this journey of learning the relationship between science and faith and just lessons from books that we read as we go. So I'll read from Romans chapter 1, verse, uh, let's go back to verse 20. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, it's important to recognize that God made the world. And so in this series in logic, we're going to talk about science, apologetics, philosophy, faith. We want our students to learn to think well and think clearly. Uh, one country that did a lot of this type of uh, education, by the way, is Scotland. And you wonder why, you know, we have a lot of leading thinkers from Scotland. And I believe it's because they really emphasize the importance of logic and critical thinking, which we need our students to have today. So welcome to this journey where we'll talk Talk about apologetics, science, and faith. Enjoy as we go through our first book by Dr. Stephen Meyer called The Return of the God Hypothesis. Welcome to the first reading in our series, The Return of the God Hypothesis by Dr. Stephen Meyer. I have the book right here. I have looked forward to reading this book and I'm excited to read it along with you as you watch with me. Um, I will be giving my thoughts, comments as we go along in the book. Uh, my background is in uh, medical physics and chemistry. I also teach a lot of mathematics and I've written um, uh, resources for K-12 students in the mathematical space. That's a little bit of my background. There's a whole video in the, uh, uh, our podcast series called uh, Education Revolution, where I tell a little more of my story. You can go there. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we're going to start with this book called The Return of the God Hypothesis. Dr. Stephen Meyer has also written Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt. The first page here just says Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries that Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. We are reading through his book as a way for some of my uh, friends in Nigeria who don't have access to this book to uh, learn what I'm learning. And then it's also a way for me to share some thoughts as a, uh, a mathematician, well, as a chemist, medical physicist who loves math and philosophy. And so I'm going to add that as we go through the book. Before we go into the book, here's the biography of Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in the philosophy of science. He directs the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute in Seattle, and he has authored the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell in London, and the Times supplement, literally, Literary Supplement Book of the Year. I have met Dr. Meyer, and it's been a, a pleasure getting, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity uh, meeting him. It was a blessing. On the back of the book, there's a few people that have biographies, oh, oh, oh uh, uh, sorry, comments, but I will say one thing about one of them, Dr. James Tor. Dr. James Tor says, when you don't understand the details of living systems, ignorance permits discounting a creator. But when the details of science are thrust upon you, you are forced to ask, how on earth literally did that happen? Thus, the God hypothesis returns. Stephen Meyer convincingly drives the point home. How could it be this way? only God. 
Dr. James Tor is a wonderful man. There's another day's story there. But uh, Dr. James Tor is at Rice University. He's actually done a video not recently with, with Dr. John Lennox. So those are a lot of names. We'll get back to our book. But I just want you to understand in the field of the philosophy of science and the field of um, uh, sort of intelligent design, understanding the relationship between science and faith and design in the universe, it is important to know some key people. So if you want to learn the, the, the apologetics as a relates to science, you would want to know Dr. Stephen Meyer because of his work in philosophy of science. His background was in is in physics. You would want to know Dr. John Lennox out of Oxford University. His background is in mathematics. And Dr. Lennox is one of the kindest people you ever meet. He loves, uh, loves Jesus and he loves talking about truth. And ultimately, we could talk all day about apologetics, but what it really comes down to is what kind of lives do we want to live and who are we going to live for? And ultimately, that goes back to knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for you. The book of Romans in the Bible talks about this in more detail. Um, so we've talked about Dr. Stephen Meyer, Dr. John Lennox, Dr. James Tor. Um, there are some people who have written on the fine-tuning argument specifically. Jay Richards has written a book called The Privileged Planet. So if you're taking notes, uh, I will encourage you to just make sure you take notes of some of these books and resources. And I'll try and have a document ready and handy uh, where you can go over those things. I do have a few books to my right. I don't agree with everything in all of them, but these are great resources. You don't have to go through all of them right now, especially if you don't have time. But there are some key books, such as The Return of the God Hypothesis. Let's dive in. Prologue. It was a public speaker's nightmare unfolding at a most, most inauspicious time. 18 minutes into my opening statement in a debate with physicist Lawrence Krauss, America's most prolific, uh, prominent scientific atheist, I suddenly found that I no longer read my own PowerPoint slides. He could no longer read his PowerPoint slides. The brightly colored swirls or auras, for me, a telltale sign of the onset of a debilitating migraine, had begun to fill my visual field as I looked out through the blaze of lights behind the video cameras in a packed auditorium at the University of Toronto. Speaking of the University of Toronto, by the way, that's where Jordan Peterson used to be, uh, Jordan, Dr. Jordan Peterson. And of course, Dr. Peterson and I theologically are not on the same page, but I will say this. There's a lot of things he's talked about that I agree with in, in encouraging people to take responsibility and live a life that you know, makes sense. It, it, it very, uh, very good things that can help young men, don't get me wrong, and young women. But the University of Toronto and Dr. Peterson, there were some things that happened there that were not good. Um, Dr. Peterson was trying to stand for what he believed and how he wanted to address things. And unfortunately, that didn't go well at that university. It is very unfortunate that many universities in America and Canada and, and in the Western societies have lost their bearing on basic truth. So if you're watching this in Nigeria, if you're watching this in other parts of the world, I do want to warn you that if you go to certain American universities, you might find out that some things are not making sense. Like, like Harvard has lost its bearing on certain things. Uh, you know, we could go down the list. So I want you to be very careful when you come or when you engage with these universities not to think that because it's a prestigious university, it's a good thing and you should take everything they say. And you might argue, of course, Amos, nobody does that. Well, I've watched people come from Nigeria to America and the types of arguments they've started making make me realize, yeah, they, they are doing a good job brainwashing people to believe things that are just not true. Again, this is not every university and this is not every professor, but I think it's very important that we're honest with ourselves. And please know that there are good professors in many universities. And I'm trying to be as kind and gentle with this topic, but some things have gotten out of hand. Like we can't even define basic things anymore. And people are ostracized for believing things differently. That's what happened at the University of Toronto. Sorry for the long interlude, but that's important to note for those watching. Intense light had often been a common migraine trigger for me, and it certainly was on, was on that night in March 2016. As the auras spread, I began having trouble seeing not only the quotations and scientific diagrams on my slides, but, but Professor Krauss himself and the audience as well. Other neurological symptoms, numbness in my fingers and tongue, my voice echoing in my own head, and a difficulty finding words, aphasia, followed predictably in rapid succession. I was able to make it through the remaining seven minutes of my presentation by speaking more slowly and deliberately than I usually do, and in some cases by using less technical words. But as I descended from the podium I, and I was taken to a dark room, I felt both disoriented and disappointed. I realized it would now be difficult for me to say much in the ensuing roundtable following a third speaker about the main question of the forum, the one I specifically came to address or to discuss. 
The organizers of the forum had chosen the topic, What's Behind It All? God, Science, and the Universe. Professor Krauss, then of Arizona State University, and I were a logical match to discuss this question from opposing points of view. Indeed, he and I had debated twice before, and I had often debated other scientific atheists during the preceding decade. Krauss, who spoke first, had a reputation not only as an accomplished physicist, but also as a bold and outspoken controversialist, one with a talent for explaining scientific ideas to popular audiences. He's also well known for his provocative thesis that quantum physics can explain how the universe came, from being, from, it came into being from nothing. So he's also well known for, the, for his provo provocative thesis that quantum physics can explain how the universe came into being from nothing. But that evening, he didn't begin with a defense of that position. Instead, he began by declaring the topic of the forum unworthy of reflection and by characterizing me as unworthy of engagement. Indeed, he began the debate, by, he began the debate indulging in nearly 10 minutes of what his boisterous supporters clearly regarded as deliciously personal, inventive, denouncing both me and, by extension, the organizers of the forum. If you appear on stage with someone talking about these ideas, it gives the impression that the ideas are worth debating or that the person is worth debating. Professor Krauss declared, in this case, neither is true. When a rival in debate descends into ad hominem argument, I usually find myself surprised at his willingness to waste a lot of time. So an ad hominem argument is an attack on the character of the person, right? So we're going to be talking about this in more detail in logic. But this is the beginning of the book. There's more here. I'm just going to pause. But I want to say that in logic, it's important that we try to distinguish people's ideas from who they are and try to analyze those ideas well. And this is unfortunate that an ad hominem argument was happening. There is a good book here by uh, Dr. Jason Lyle, uh, Answers in Genesis, that goes over different logic topics, about 36 of them. We went through that at our school the first year, and one of them was ad hominem. Let's pause here, and we'll come back and continue uh, learning about this debate between Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Meyer. Have a blessed day.